House prices are apparently going to boom in 2024 and 2025, and that's according to KPMG. So people much smarter than I am are coming out and suggesting that yes, price growth is coming. And this is while interest rates are so high at the moment, people are getting so concerned with inflation and the short term, they can't really look beyond the next 12 months. So in this video, I want to unwrap exactly what they're saying, share with you my thoughts. And if you're new here and you don't know who I am, I run a buyer's agency, one of the fastest growing buyer's agencies in Australia. And I'm going to share with you exactly what we're seeing on the ground floor. If you're interested, definitely keep watching. Hey guys, my name's Ravi and welcome back to Personal Finance with Ravi Sharma. If you're new here, smash that subscribe button because I talk about real estate, cryptocurrency and financial freedom. Now, if you aren't already following me on Instagram, definitely go and follow me there. It's Personal Finance with Ravi with a blue tick mark there. And the reason I say go follow me there is because you'll see more content, more memes and a lot more around finance for free every single day. So if I'm not here, I'm definitely over there. Now, a couple of days ago, KPMG came out and said house prices to surge in financial year 25. KPMG economics report finds house prices to rise gradually over the next nine months and then surge in financial year 2025. Now, why do we think these dates are important? Well, I'm gonna to link to you a video here, which is actually talking about the 18.6 year cycle. It's the land cycles and how it all works with years and years of data from Western economies. And yes, it's been appropriated for what's happening in Australia. But the main takeaway from that is we've always seen the winner's curse, which is the last part of this absolute blow off top where prices are going absurd. A lot of FOMO comes into the play. And according to that cycle, we're probably seeing a peak in and around between 2026 and 2028. So this would play out quite nicely with what we could be seeing. But again, go watch that video. It provides so much more context. And with that, let's continue. House prices will rise nationally to 4.9% over the next nine months and then surge by 9.4% in the year to June 2025. KPMG's new property report on Australia capital cities finds. Apartment prices across the country will see an average rise of 3.1% by next June and then a 6% increase in the next 12 months. But there will be important regional differences with Perth houses rising the highest by 8.4% in the rest of financial year 24, but then Hobart overtaking other cities in financial year 25 and surging by 14.2%. Hobart units also outperform all other capital cities with rises of 8.7% and 10% respectively over the next two years, followed by Sydney, Melbourne, and Adelaide. The report details the varied pressures impacting on property prices with the range of push and pull factors countering each other, but with limited supply and high demand ultimately outweighing interest rates. So let's take a pause, let's take a breath here and really understand what they're saying. They're basically saying market go boom boom. Now, before I get murdered in the comments down below, let's just take stock of where we're at right now. We have always been hearing about this mortgage cliff and it's coming, it's coming and it's coming and then it'll be gone. And suddenly it'd be such a non-event. I know some people are struggling out there, so my heart goes out to those people. But what I think is really key right now is to not over leverage yourself. It's to really get into smart positions and have cash ready for an emergency. And that's why we always have an emergency fund. Simply going out there buying property and thinking, yeah, okay, I bought property, I'm gonna make a lot of money. What happens if the worst case scenario plays out and you actually don't have a job and your tenant doesn't pay your rent. Well, that's where you're screwed. And this is the difference between those who can hold their properties through multiple cycles, ultimately come out winners in 20 or 30 years. I know people that buy property simply going, oh, well, I have no money next to my name, but that's okay. Property prices will go up and in six months time, I'll have an emergency buffer. Yeah, that's if things all go to plan, but if they don't and you need to sell the house, well, then effectively you're losing money. And this is the key takeaway from this video. It's that if prices increase by financial year 24 or financial year 25, Actually, you know what? I'll leave the key takeaways till the end. Let's continue. Dr. Brendan Ryan, KPMG chief economist said, despite high interest rates, constrained supply will likely dominate the factors influencing property prices in the short term and result in continued price gains in most markets during financial year 24. House and unit prices will then accelerate further in the next financial year as dwelling supply continues to be limited due to scarcity of available land, falling levels of approvals and slower or more costly construction activity. It almost feels like he's watched videos on this channel from like, nine months ago. <laughs> These are the factors that I was considering when I came out and said, look, prices are gonna go higher despite what you and I think about the mortgage rates, about mortgage cliff and all the other rubbish that was out there. It was a matter of supply and demand. It is very different here in Australia than it is to the rest of the world. Why? Well, look at this image right here. Does this look like it's different to every other country? It sure does. And that's why we need to go, hey, we can't just listen to some of the analysts that say this is what's happening in the US, so that must happen in Canada. And if it happens in Canada, it's gonna happen here in Australia. And I don't say that just for the positive side, of things, I also say it for the negative side of things. So if we're in a position where we see a recession in the US, do we see some of those factors play out here? Yeah, probably. But at what level does it affect us? And if you're someone that's actually positioned quite well, you could use that as an opportunity. So let's take this for example.
example. If you are in a position where you have a lot of cash and you have assets, you could go and deploy your cash now, all of it, or you could deploy some of it and then come back into the market in six months if the worst case scenario plays out. Or you may just sit on the sideline saying, I don't wanna get involved in this market, some shit's gonna go down. Let's say you go and use all your money and you have nothing left in the tank and you say, look, I don't have any assets I need to get in. Well, you're making the best decision of your life if you have an emergency fund. You need to have assets. It doesn't matter what stage of the cycle you're in. You need to have assets to protect your wealth, otherwise you're gonna lose. Don't listen to the headlines and don't listen to your uncle because at the end of the day, your money has definitely lost value. And if you can attach yourself with the right assets, you'll do quite well. But if you're looking at the short term and say, okay, I don't have any assets, I couldn't go and buy a property and then I'll still have emergency funds, I would be going and doing that. If you're someone who has assets and you have some cash left over, you'll go, well, I'm probably gonna stretch myself, but I still have an emergency fund. That's the position I'm in. I'm going out there buying more. But if you're someone that now is in a position where if you have no emergency fund and you're going all in because, hey, prices are gonna go up according to KPMG, what happens if it doesn't? And then you're suddenly in a position where you may have to offload that asset because you don't have any funds there in case of an emergency. And where would that emergency really come out of? Well, if we do have this worldwide recession, worst case scenarios play out, you might not have a job. And therefore you need the cash there to help sustain you because as we've gone through any other downturn, it does last, but you will pass through it. And those who can build their asset base during these times will do really, really well. And the only way you're gonna ensure that you do really, really well is if you have that emergency fund. Sounds pretty simple, yet for some reason, people just don't execute on this. The supply issue will combine with several other factors to push asset prices up. Higher demand due to heavier migration, anticipated rate cuts moving into financial year 25, and potentially relaxed lending conditions. High rental costs pushing renters to look to buy instead. Barriers to developers building new homes, foreign investor demand picking up again, along with the longer post-pandemic demand for more space as people continue to work from home. There are so many factors at play and simply looking at headlines going, oh, well, that's what it means. If Sydney's gonna go up, then I should just buy anything in Sydney. Well, no, because if you buy a dud investment property, then you're actually gonna get screwed, especially if it's a unit in a unit block that has like 200 other units that look exactly the same. There are some factors pushing the other way, the main one being mortgage stress. First time buyers now need to use about half their earnings on mortgage repayments, a significant rise from a third just three years ago. We estimate around 350 billion of mortgages or half of all fixed rate credit will expire this year covering 880,000 Australian households. The remaining 38% of fixed rate credit, which includes about 450,000 loan facilities will expire in 2024 and beyond. Some homeowners who previously locked in low rates might be unable to pay and won't be able to refinance to a lower and competitive rate. Now, while that sounds all really scary, just take a breath and understand that less than a third of all Australians that have a house actually have a mortgage. And the average LVR in Australia is closer to about 30%. So it's not as big of a deal as some people put it out to be. Now, sure, if you have an increase in 10% of you know supply coming onto the market, yeah, you're screwed. But the reality is right now, if you are going to go through the banking system and say, look, I can't afford to pay for my own home and we're gonna go through collections or we're gonna go through some debt payment plan, that's gonna take like six to 12 months to eventuate anyway. And in 12 months time, if we see rates lower, we're gonna see prices higher. They may be in a position where they don't need to offload the property as a distress selling and I'm so desperate to sell. They could actually go to market and say, well, look, we'll sell it, but we now get the price we actually want. They'll pay off all of their debts and they're back to square one. You must personally know people that are in a position where they're struggling because that repayments have increased a lot. Now think about it. If you're someone that has not seen interest rates increase and you go, okay, well, this is great, low interest rates, I'm all good. And you do this in say early 2022 and then the rates start increasing. They start increasing a little bit and then a lot. And then you're like, okay, now I'm gonna be in trouble if I don't offload my property or make significant changes in my lifestyle. What's the last thing people will let go of? Their home, right? It's the shelter. Now in previous cycles, you may have gone, oh, you know what? I could probably just sell my property, you know, break even or even make 10, $20,000 and I'll go rent something. But if there's no rental properties available and we've seen vacancy rates at record lows, people have to now go, well, I have no other choice. I need to hold this home. And the only way I can hold this home is increase my work hours, find a new job, find a second job, find a third job, or I need to tighten my belt when it comes to lifestyle. And I know people personally that have gone down this path to say, well, look, I have no other choice, which means I'm probably not gonna shop 
organic. I'm just going to have to buy what's available. Or I'm going to eat a lot healthier instead of buying all this other unnecessary rubbish. I might have to get rid of that third gym membership because I didn't even go to the first two gyms. So why do I have a third gym membership? The point I'm trying to make is that if this was happening a year ago, you could see and understand that it came out of nowhere. But now we've been living in high interest rate environment for the better part of 12 months. And we've started seeing a slowdown. We've seen three months of pauses. We're probably going to get another pause at the next meeting from the RBA. And if you're someone that's been on a fixed rate for say two years, you haven't really felt the pain yet. So you're going, oh my God, my interest rates are going to go up. That means I can forecast what I need to save now. And the smart people are doing exactly that. They're like, hey, in six months, it's going to expire. So I may as well start saving all of the money I need to be able to make those repayments later. Or I'll go on holidays now because I know I definitely can't afford it later. But on balance, the factors pushing prices up will more than counter those restraining them. Market dynamics vary across different cities. So there will be considerable regional variations. Those regional variations in prices have been significant over the three years since the start of the pandemic. The report outlines Adelaide houses outperformed the national average with prices rising 40% from June 2020 to June 2023, with no sign of having been impacted by the contractionary monetary policy cycle. By contrast, after sharp rises during the pandemic, Sydney and Melbourne house prices fell by 1.3% and 1.4% over the year to June 2023. Those numbers for Sydney and Melbourne were closer to about 7% when the market was actually at the low. Now, markets have started recovering and they're only about 1% off where they were a year ago, which is quite a big recovery, especially for markets that are so expensive. That's largely driven by the lack of supply and the amount of immigration that's coming into the country that are wanting to live in Sydney and Melbourne. Now, where it gets really crazy is in June 2020, we were buying a shitload of property in Adelaide. And I know some of my clients are watching, so well done for trusting us, but also trusting the process in getting in when nobody else wanted to. This is where it really comes down to your focus and outsourcing to experts in those areas. So if you're interested in getting help with buying in the right locations and not having to go to a bunch of open homes and doing the research yourself only to then question yourself, then definitely go check out this video. It's a step-by-step -step of exactly how we work. And after that video, you can book in a call with my team for free and we can discuss exactly how we can help. Now be sure to watch all the way through because I will actually share with you their price predictions around the growth of each of those capital cities. And that is gonna be very interesting to break down. Other factors have changed from the height of the pandemic, the report observes. The generous home builder stimulus led to a surge of housing approvals and subsequent completions. But shrinking approvals and steadily rising building material costs are now constraining housing supply. Migration too, which collapsed during the pandemic, will rise by over 400,000 this year, while foreign investment is steadily recovering, albeit still lower than pre-pandemic levels, particularly with the relaxation of travel restrictions and the reopening of China's borders. The report outlines that rising rental costs can play a significant role in pushing up dwelling prices as more renters try for home ownership. Owner occupiers love paying way above. And a classic example of this was yesterday. Let me tell you a story. We go and find this property and we say, okay, cool. We know there's value around $450,000 to $460,000. We know the market value is probably closer to about $470,000. So we end up putting our offers through and just before the agent was able to accept our offer, an owner occupier arrived and they paid well over. They ended up paying $488,000 for this property. We're like, well, we definitely can't compete with that because that seems like stupidity to me. So we let it go. Only for a week later to have their finance fall through. The agent gives us a call being their first call and they said, look, we really don't want to go back to market. We definitely don't want to do open homes again. Are you ready to come back at your original offer? And that's what we did. We got back into the offer. We ended up securing it for like 28,000 less than what someone was willing to pay for it. And that's why it's very important that you buy in areas that have strong appeal from owner occupiers. Because when it comes time to sell, and it might not even be your property, it might be your neighbor or it might be across the street. If they're looking to sell and they have owner occupiers going for it, you best believe they're going to pay way over. And when they pay way over, that's going to start bumping up your valuations when the banks come around to do it as well. Mr. Ryan said that based on our projections for new dwelling completions and the Treasury's population forecast, we estimate the annual rent growth will be 5.6% over the next two years, which is 2.5% higher than the long-term average of 3.1%. We assess that dwelling completions would have to be around 76% higher than is currently forecast for those rental costs to be pulled back to normal levels. Either that or population growth for migration would have to be brought down to considerably lower levels than at present, which would mean short-term costs over overriding long-term economic benefits. And this is very important is that you can either control one of the two things. You can go and increase supply, but if there's not enough people getting approvals to actually purchase those investments or properties, then there's not enough rental stock being created. Equally, if you just have more people flooding into the country, demand's increasing, supply stays the same, if not reduces. That's obviously going to lead to higher prices. Now, an easier way to just deal with the short-term rental issue is just decrease the amount of people that are coming into the country. But the issue is that is short-term thinking versus the long-term planning the government has. They need more 
people here, more tax slaves as I like to call it, because we ultimately will get more money into the system and that will then allow us to avoid a major recession and have the economy keep moving. Now what we've got here is the forecast of growth in house prices. Percentage change in dwelling price from corresponding quarter of previous year. What we're looking for is what their forecasts look like. So apparently Sydney is gonna grow by 6.6% to December 24 and then 10.3% to June 25. Melbourne is at 8.5% December 24 and then 12% June 25. Brisbane is 2.6 and then led to 4.2. Adelaide is 5.6 led to 6.8. Perth is 8% and then 8.8%. Hobart is 11.3% then to 14.2% and this would largely be driven by the fact that last couple of years for Hobart hasn't been that great. So houses and units haven't really performed that well over the last 18 to 24 months. In contrast when you see Brisbane's numbers being quite low you start questioning everyone that was buying over the last couple of years on the basis that oh well there's the Olympic Games that are happening so surely that's going to drive prices up. So according to this apparently nobody wants to buy there anymore. I don't agree with that. I think there are still some great opportunities in every pocket of every capital city but more notably is regional areas. What we're not talking about in this report is what are the flow on effects to these other smaller capital cities which is what I like to call them. I think it's fairly evident that if you put the facts on paper and you looked at it objectively you'll realize the answer of higher asset prices over the long term is the correct answer. In the short term could we have a recession? Could we have interest rates go even further? Or could we have inflation stick around for a lot longer? It doesn't matter. What you need to focus on is your strategy, having the emergency fund in case something goes wrong but be very active with your hands because the opportunity will come and go by and if these numbers even come remotely true you've just missed out again. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and if you've enjoyed it definitely smash that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Check out like the thousand other videos I've got on the channel and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Thanks guys.